I Pencil, My Family Tree is Told by Leonard E. Reed. Introduction by Lawrence W. Reed. Eloquent, extraordinary, timeless, paradigm shifting, classic. Six decades after it first appeared, Leonard Reed's I Pencil still evokes adjectives of such praise. Rightfully so, for this little essay opens eyes and minds among people of all ages. Many first-time readers never see the world quite the same again. Ideas are most powerful when they're wrapped in a compelling story. Leonard's main point, economies can hardly be planned when not one soul possesses all the know-how and skills to, to produce a simple pencil, unfolds in the enchanting words of a pencil itself. Leonard could have written I car or I airplane, but choosing those more complex items would have muted the message. No one person, repeat no one, no matter how smart or how many degrees follow his name, could create from scratch a small everyday pencil, let, a, let alone a car or an airplane. This is a message that humbles the high and mighty. It pricks the inflated egos of those who think they know how to mind everybody else's business. It explains in plain language why central planning is an exercise in arrogance and futility, or what Nobel laureate and Austrian economist F. A. Hayek aptly termed the pretense of knowledge. Indeed, a major influence on Reed's thinking in this regard was Hayek's famous 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society. In demolishing the spurious claims of the socialists of the day, Hayek wrote, This is not a dispute about whether planning is to be done or not. It is a dispute as to whether planning is to be done centrally by one authority for the whole economic system, or is it to be divided among many individ individuals. Maximilien Robespierre is said to have blessed the horrific French Revolution with this chilling decoration. On, yeah, I'm not even going to attempt the French here, so it, it gives a French sentence, but the translation is, one cannot expect to make an omelet without breaking eggs. A consummate sat statist who worked tirelessly to plan the lives of others, he would become the architect of the revolution's bloodiest phase, the reign of terror of, 19, of 1793 to 94. Robespierre and his guillotine broke eggs by the thousands in a vain effort to impose a utopian society with government planners at the, at the top and everybody else at the bottom. That French experience is but one example of in a disturbingly familiar pattern. Call them what you will, socialists, interventionists, collectivist statists, history is littered with their presumptuous plans for rearranging society to fit their vision of the common good. Plans that always fail as they kill or impoverish other people in the process. If socialism ever earns a final epitaph, it will be this. Here lies a contrivance engineered by know-it-alls who broke eggs with abandon but never, ever created an omelet. None of the Robespierre's of the world knew how to make a pencil, yet they wanted to remake entire societies. How utterly preposterous and mournfully tragic, but we will miss a large implication of Leonard Reed's message if we assume it, on it aims only at the tyrants whose names we all know. The lesson of I Pencil is not that error begins when the planners plan big. It begins the moment one tosses hum humi humility aside, assumes he knows the unknowable, and employs the force of the state against peaceful individuals. That's not just a national disease. It can be very local, indeed. In our midst, there are people who think that if they only had the government power on their side, they could pick tomorrow's winners and losers in the marketplace, set prices or rents where they ought to be, decide the fo which forms of energy should power our homes and cars, and choose which industries should survive and which should die. They should stop for a few moments and learn a little humility from a lowly writing implement. While I Pencil shoots down the baseless expectations for central planning, it provides a supremely uplifting perspective of the individual. 
guided by Adam Smith's invisible hand of prices, property, profits, and incentives, free people can accomplish economic miracles of which socialist theoreticians can only dream. As the interests of countless individuals from around the world converge to produce pencils without a single mastermind, so do they also come together in free markets to feed, clothe, educate, house, and entertain hundreds of millions of people at ever higher levels. With great pride, FEE publishes this new edition of iPencil to mark the essay's timeless message for a new generation. Someday there will be a centen Someday there will be a centennial edition, maybe even a millennial one. This essay is truly one for the ages. Lawrence W. Reed, President, Foundation for Economic Education, May 2015. I Pencil, My Family Tree, as told by Leonard E. Reed. I am a lead pencil, the ordinary wooden pencil familiar to all boys and girls and adults who can read and write. Writing is both my vocation and my avocation. That's all I do. You may wonder why I should write a genealogy. Well, to begin with, my story is interesting, and next, I am a mystery more so than a tree or a sunset or even a flash of lightning, but sadly I am taken for granted by those who use me as if I were a mere incident and without background. This supercilious attitude relegates me to the highest level of, of the commonplace. This is a species of the grievous error in which mankind cannot too long persist without peril. For the wise G.K. Chesterton observed, we are perishing for want of wonder, not for want of wonders. I, Pencil, simple though I appear to be, merit your wonder and awe, a claim I shall attempt to prove. In fact, if you can understand me, no, that's too much to ask of anyone. If you can become aware of the miraculousness which I symbolize, you can help save the freedom of mankind it is so unhappily losing. I have a profound lesson to teach, and I can teach this lesson better than can an automobile or an airplane or a mechanical dishwasher because, well, I am so seemingly simple. Simple, yet not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. This sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Especially when it is realized that there are, a, there are about one and one half billion of my kind produced in the USA each year. Pick me up and look me over. What do you see? Not much meet, meets the eye. There's some wood, lacquer, the printed labeling, graphite lead, and a bit of metal and an eraser. Innumerable antecedents. Just as you cannot trace your family tree back very far, so it is impossible for me to name and explain all my antecedents. But I would like to suggest enough of them to impress upon you the richness and complexity of my background. My family tree begins with what is, in fact, a tree, a cedar of straight grain that grows in Northern California and Oregon. Now contemplate all the saws and trucks and the rope and countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and numberless skills that went into their fabrication, the mining of ore, the making of steel, its refinement into the saws, axes, and motors, the growing of hemp and bringing up Bring it through, bring, bringing it through all the stages to heavy and strong rope. The logging camps with their beds and mess halls, the cookery and the raising of all the foods, why untold thousands of persons had a hand in every cup of coffee the loggers drink. The logs are shipped to the meal in San Leonardo, California. Can you imagine the individuals who make flat cars and rails and railroads and engines and who construct, construct the and install the communication systems incidental thereto? These legions are among my antecedents. Consider the mill work in San Leonardo. The cedar logs are cut into small pencil length slats less than one fourth of an inch in thickness. These are kiln dried and then tinted for the same reason women put rouge on their faces. People prefer that I look pretty, not a pallid white. These Slats are waxed and kiln dried again. How many skills went into the making of the tent and the kilns, into supplying the heat, the light, and power, the belts, the motors, and all the other things a mill requires? 
Sweeper is in the mail among my ancestors? Yes, and included are the men who poured the concrete for the dam of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company hydro plant which supplies the mill's power. Don't overlook the ancestors present and distant who have a hand in transporting 60 carloads of slats across the nation. Once in the pencil factory, four million dollars in machinery and building, all capital accumulated by thrifty and saving parents of mine. Each slat is given eight grooves by a complex machine, after which another machine lays lead on every other slat, applies gr glue, and places another slat atop. A lead sandwich, so to speak. Seven brothers and I are mechanically carved from this wood clinched sandwich. My lead itself it contains no lead at all, is complex. The graphite is mined in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Consider these miners and those who make their many tools and the makers of the paper sacks in which graphite is shipped and those who make the string that ties the sacks and those who put them aboard ships and those who make the ships. Even the lighthouse keepers along the way assisted in my birth and the harbor pilots. The graphite is mixed with clay from the Mississippi, which ammonium hydroxide is used in the, in, the, in the refining process. Then wetting agents are added, such as sulfonate, sulfonated tallow, animal fats chemical, chemically reacted with sulfuric acid. After passing through numerous machines, the mixture finally appears as an endless extrusions. As from a sausage grinder cut to size, dried, and baked for several hours at 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit. To increase their strength and smoothness, the, the leads are then treated with a hot mixture which includes candelia, wax from Mexico, paraffin wax, and hydrogenated natural fats. My cedar receives six coats of lacquer. Do you know all the ingredients of lacquer? Who would think that the growers of castor beans and the refiners of castor oil are all a part of it? They are. Observe the labeling. That's a film formed by applying heat to carbon black mi mixed with resins. How do you make resins and what, pray, is carbon black? Why, even the process by which the lacquer is made into a beautiful yellow in involved the skills of more persons than one can enumerate. My bit of metal, the, fer the ferrule, is brass. Think of all the persons who mine zinc and copper and those who have the skills to make shiny sheet brass from these products of nature. Those black rings on my ferrule are black nickel. What is black nickel and how is it applied? The complete story of why the center of my ferrule has no black nickel on it would take pages to explain. Then there's my crown and glory, and elegantly referred to in the trade as the plug, the part man uses to erase the airs he makes with me. An ingredient called factus is what does the erasing. It is a rubber-like product made by reacting rapeseed oil from the Dutch East Indies, Indonesia, with sulfur chloride. Rubber, contrary to the common notion, is only for binding purposes. Then, too, there are numerous vulcanizing and accelerating agents. The pumice comes from Italy, and the pigment which gives the plug its color is cadmium sulfide. No one knows. Does anyone wish to challenge my earlier assertion that no single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me? Actually, millions of human beings have had a hand in my creation, no one of whom knows more than a very few of the others. Now you may say that I go too far in relating the picker of the coffee berry in far off Brazil and the food growers elsewhere to my creation, that this is an extreme position. I shall stand by my claim. There isn't a single person in all these millions, including the president of the pencil company, who contributes more than a tiny infinitesimal bit of know-how. From the standpoint of know-how, the only difference between the miners of graphite in Ceylon and the logger in Oregon is the type of know-how. Neither the miner nor the logger can be dispensed with. Any more can be the chemist at the factory or the worker in the oil field, paraffin being the byproduct by of petroleum. Here is an astounding fact. Neither the worker in the oil field, nor the chemist, nor the digger of graphite or clay, nor any man who runs or makes the ships or trains or trucks, nor the one who runs the machine that does the knurling on my bit of metal, nor the president of the company performs his singular task because he wants me. 
Each one wants me less, perhaps, than does a child in the first grade. Indeed, there are some among this vast multitude who never saw a pencil, nor would they know how to use one. Their motivation is other than me. Perhaps it is something like this. Each of these millions sees that he can thus exchange his tiny know-how for the goods and services he needs or wants. I may or may not be among these items. No mastermind. There is a fact still more astounding. The absence of a mastermind, of anyone dictating or forcibly directing these countless actions which bring me into being. No trace of such a person can be found. Instead we find the invisible hand at work. This is a mystery to which I earlier, earlier referred. It has been said that only God can make a tree. Why do we agree with this? Isn't it because we realize that we ourselves could not make one? Indeed, can we even describe a tree? We cannot, except in superficial terms. We can say, for instance, that a certain molecular configuration manifests itself as a tree, but what mind is there among men that could even record, let alone direct, the constant changes in molecules that transpire in the lifespan of a tree? Such a feat is utterly unthinkable. I pencil am a complex combination of miracles a tree zinc copper graphite and so on but to these miracles which manifest themselves in nature an even more extraordinary miracle has been added the configuration of a creative human energies millions of tiny know-hows configuring naturally and spontaneously in response to human necessity and desire in the absence of any human mastermind since only God can make a tree, I insist that only God can make me. Man can no more direct these millions of know-hows to bring me into being than he could put the molecules together to create a tree. The above is what I mean when writing, if you can become aware of the miraculousness which I symbolize, you can help save the freedom mankind is so unhappily losing. For if one is aware that these know-hows will naturally, yes, automatically arrange themselves into creative and productive patterns in response to human necessity and demand, that is, in the absence of governmental or any other coercive masterminding, then one will possess an absolutely essential ingredient for freedom, a faith in free people. Freedom is impossible without this faith. Once a government has, a, has had a monopoly of creative activities such, for instance, as the delivery of the mails, most individuals will believe that the mails could not be efficiently delivered by men acting freely. And here is the reason. Each one acknowledges that he himself does not know how to do all the things incident to mail delivery. He also recognizes that no other individual could do it. These assumptions are correct. No individual possesses enough know-how to perform a nation's mail delivery any more than any individual possesses enough know-how to make a pencil. Now, in the absence of faith in free people, and the unawareness that millions of tiny know-hows would naturally and miraculously conform and cooperate to satisfy this necessity, the individual cannot help but reach the erroneous conclusion that mail can be delivered only by governmental masterminding. Testimony galore. If I, pencil, were the only item that could offer testimony in what men and women can accomplish when free to try, then those with little faith would, see, would have a fair case. However, there is testimony galore. It's all about us on every hand. Mail delivery is exceedingly simple when compared, for instance, to the making of an automobile, or the calculating machine, or a grain combine, or, the, or a milling machine, or to tens of thousands of other things delivery? Why, in this area where men have been left free to try, they deliver on the human voice around the world in less than one second. They deliver an event visually and in motion to any person's home when it is happening. They deliver 150 passengers from Seattle to Baltimore in less than four hours. They deliver gas from Texas to one's range or furnace in New York at unbelievably low rates and without subsidy. They deliver four pounds of oil from the Persian Gulf to our eastern seaboard, halfway around the world, for less money than the government charges for delivering a one-ounce letter across the street. The lesson I have to teach is this. Leave all creative energies uninhibited. Merely organize society to act in harm harmony with this lesson. Let society's legal apparatus remove all obstacles the best it can. Permit these creative know-hows to freely flow. 
Have faith that free men and women will respond to the invisible hand. This faith will be confirmed. I, Pencil, seemingly simple though I am, offer the miracle of my creation as testimony that this is a practical faith, as practical as the sun, the rain, a cedar tree, the good earth. An Afterward by Milton Friedman Leonard Reed's delightful story, I, Pencil, has become a classic, and deservedly so. I know of no other piece of literature so, that so succinctly, persuasively, and effectively illustrates the meaning of both Adam Smith's invisible hand, the possibility of cooperation without coercion, and Friedrich Hayek's emphasis on the importance of dispersed knowledge and the role of the price system in communicating information that will make the individuals do the desirable things without having anyone telling them what to do. We use Leonard's story in our television show, Free to Choose, in, and in the accompanying book of the same title to illustrate the power of the market. The title both of both the first segment of the TV show and chapter one of the book. We summarized the story and then went on to say, None of the thousands of persons involved in producing the pencil performed has his task because he wanted a pencil. Some among them never saw a pencil and would not know what it, what it is for. Each saw his work as a way to get the goods and services he wanted, goods and services we produced in order to get the pencil we wanted. Every time we go to the store and buy a pencil, we are exchanging a little bit of our services for the infinitesimally small amount of services that each of the thousands have contributed towards producing the pencil. It is even more astounding that the pencil was ever produced. No one sitting in a central office gave these orders to these thousands of people. No military police enforced the orders that were not given. These people live in many lands, speaking different languages, practice different religions, may even hate one another, yet none of these differences prevented them from cooperating to produce a pencil. How did that happen? Adam Smith gave us an answer to 200 years ago. I, Pencil, is a typical Leonard Reed product. Imaginative, simple yet subtle, breathing the love of freedom that imboot, embedded everything Leonard wrote or did. Ed, as, as in the rest of his work, he was not trying to tell people what to do or how to conduct themselves. He was simply trying to enhance the individual's understanding of themselves and the, of the system they live in. That was his basic credo and one that he stuck to consistently during his long period of service to the public. Not public service in the sense of government service, Whatever the presser, pressure, he stuck to his guns, refusing to compromise on his principles. That was why he was so effective in keeping alive in the early days and then spreading that basic idea of human freedom required private property, free competition, and a severely limited government. Milton Friedman, Nobel Laureate, 1976.